I got involved with PL Engineering uh, in the late 50s. I'd known Cyril for oh, five or more years before that, because Henry Kissick was friendly with him, and I served my time with Henry, and I used to come down here occasionally with Henry, but at that time it was hush hush here, because you were, no, nobody was allowed in unless you're, you know, very well known, you know. And then I, I had to go in the raft for a couple of years, came back, served on about five years with Quail's Garage, and then um, Cyril persuaded me to come and join them here. And then uh, it worked on from there. I was just an ordinary engineer, and then he said, will you take over as foreman? So then I end up in foreman over the whole lot. This was for fiberglass, etc. Over there was the mechanical side, where we did uh, fairing brackets and all that sort of thing. And upstairs in the mill, we used to blow all the bubbles and paint all the bits for the P50s and Tridents. So I was in charge of the whole lot then. And Cyril uh, was still in charge, like, but I kept an eye on all the staff. And then he would come to me and say one day, well, George, here, I want you to make this, you know. And off we go on another project. Make a hovercraft or something like that. Everybody got on with everybody else. Uh, we're all friends, we all have a laugh and a joke. Um, most times, friend, um, Cyril had a joke with you. An odd morning he'd come in, he'd say, Good morning, Cyril, and all you'd get was a grunt. He was in a bad mood, so you kind of left him alone. Uh, and the next morning, he was all full of enthusiasm again, you know. Uh, no, but all the staff were good. Uh, and I found the staff exceptionally well, as far as workers go. The two girls were exceptional. They could do fiberglass anywhere, uh, anyhow, you know, they were absolutely brilliant. And they would do whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, and have a laugh with it, you know. So it's a very happy place to work at. So many here making boats originally of all shapes and sizes. And over there, they were doing all the mechanical stuff. Uh, upstairs, when we were doing fairness, I blew all the bubbles. Um, which is a story there that the racing fairings had double curvature uh, windscreens, right? Well, we were buying them in. That was nice. Until the firm went bust. Then we had to start and learn how to handle perspex and how to blow it in a bubble. So we had some screens for the fairings. And actually we worked out that we could blow bubbles better than the ones we were buying, you know, so that was all right. Fairing is a fiberglass molding that fits around the motorcycle and with the touring fairings had a very upright screen in front of you, made of PVC with an aluminium edge on it, and it just the wind just went over your head. The racing fairing had clip-on handlebars, and that was they were inside the fairing because the fairing went round the outside of them, so we had a, a nice. Uh, streamlined fairing with the handles inside and a bubble over the top so you could get down behind it so you were fully fully streamlined uh, and it put quite a lot of miles per hour on a, a standard bike you know um, so as, as you know they all they've all got fairings on that but Cyril was always up and running early in everything you know. I find so fine, no problem. Um, 
he didn't like his photograph being taken. The reason being, he was in the rough and the crowd he was with, uh, somehow or other, I don't know exactly what, but uh, some of the boys who with, with went out on a mission and didn't come back. And after that, because he'd had his photograph taken with them, you know, he didn't like his photograph taken. He didn't like talking very much about it for, for that reason. But um, well, he, he flew all sorts of aircraft. He wasn't a, a Spitfire pilot because of his eyesight. But uh, he kind of was delivering planes and he was repairing planes in the Ark Royal, you know. But as for working for it, with no problem. Well, it started off, uh, the racing boys were using um, aluminium fairings. And Cyril thought that was a good idea to make some motorcycle fairings. So they started off making a touring fairing, which you put on an ordinary standard bike, and you had a screen coming up in front of you, right? Very successful, uh, kept you nice and warm, etc. And then they decided to buy, to build a racing fairing, which was fully enclosed, like the, the aluminium ones were made in two parts so you could take it on and off the bike without any problem um, so that was very successful because all the top riders duke surtees you name it mcintyre you name it they all use peel fairness uh, until the bikes come in then like hondas and goodness knows what all Lots of them had fairings on them. You know, as you know, when the um, <coughs> bikes normally came in all bare, and then the later ones always had bits of fairings on, and still have bits of fairings on. So that was very successful, because in there there's a, a catwalk uh, of fairings. They made fairings anything from uh, racing fairings, for a Norton or AGS or something, down to a little 50cc Honda. So there's about six different bikes on that catalog um, at various prices from about 15 quid, and the racing one was, I think, was 25. Um, and TT week, Grand Prix week, uh, we did nothing else but fit, fit fairings here. It was two or three of us doing nothing else because people would ring up, can I have a fairness? Can I have it fitted when I'm in the Isle of Man? So we spent all the time, the week, TT week and, and Grand Prix week, or even the week before in some cases, fitting fairness. And we, we were producing about 25 fairness a month all throughout the year, which we thought was all right. At least I did. The Manx car was the best car they made. When I was in the RAF, you couldn't get leave unless it was Easter or Christmas. You had to have something special to get leave, special leave. So I applied for leave, special leave to come here and test the Manx car. And I got it. And the Manx car consisted of a tubular frame. It had 16 inch wheels. It had hydraulic brakes. It had rubber suspension. And I've got one photograph where they had a, a stationary engine on it to try and drive it, try to get cheap engine. But that was a waste of time. But eventually they put a two, two cylinder British Anzani two-stroke engine with a four-speed gearbox and reverse and electric start. Brilliant. Really went well, you know. It had rack and pinion steering and then the 
the body was in a half circle and you hinged it from the center of the half circle so the door was a quarter circle and the quarter circle went over into the other quarter so you had nothing going out into the road or anything and I, when I was in the lab, I expensed a day in the patent office in London trying to find out if there was any patents for a door like this. <laughs> and when I was doing that, but you couldn't imagine how many patents of doors and bits and doors there were. It was unbelievable. There was thousands of them. But the, the Manx car, he reckoned, was too, too dear to produce. But that was, that was the best car, no doubt about it. Well, it's just like a smart car. But it was a lot earlier than a smart car, of course. Well, there was nothing around apart from an old, a scooter. And the idea was to build something as an enclosed scooter. Something for somebody to go to work backwards and forwards to work, cheap to run, and in the dry, whereas a scooter was cheap to run, but if it was raining, you got wet. So the idea of the P50 was to keep everybody dry and go backwards and forwards to work. The only problem with it was that the engine was only 50 cc's, and unless you were a motorcyclist, you found it difficult to drive because it was only a tiny engine. So you had to rev it virtually as hard as it, it would go before you changed up to the next gear. Well, that was it. You kind of put it into gear, put your foot down, revved it as far as it would go, left the accelerator out, put it into the next gear, do the same thing again, and then put it into top gear, and then you could cruise, you know, on an ordinary flat road to about 35 mile an hour. But we had, or we tried, to get Triumphs to supply us with engines, because we, we somehow, somewhere, still got a hold of a Triumph Tina engine. Now that was a 100cc, which was giving you quite, you know, twice as much power with kind of an automatic drive. So you started it up and just put your foot down in a kind of, just like an auto, automatic car. You had an automatic drive, brilliant. But Triumphs wouldn't supply his engines. So that was that. Then Cyril decided that uh, we'd go on better and build the Tridents, two-seater. Well, it was a two-seater, but it was a bit tight. Uh, so the P-50 was kind of finished with, uh, and we we went on to the Tridents, which was a totally different thing, because the Trident was a lot lower. And then we blew a big bubble to go over the top of it. Uh, that was fine, but the same thing happened. The engine was small. Um, and you had to really rev it to get it to go. But uh, it was all right, the Trident, you know, it was stepped forward, you know. But then Chanel decided that that was it, and he sold it to Norway. And that was the end of that. We didn't hear any more about it. The idea again being that he sold it to somebody in Norway who was going to make them, and Cyril was going to get a, a percentage of, of the, you know, but uh, didn't didn't work out at all. And now, of course, the, the P50 and the Trident, there's, I think, 25 P50s left, and there are 28 Tridents. And if anybody wants to sell it, it it's really just ridiculous. The original price of a P50, I mean, there's a leaflet in there, um, £199. Funny thing is, they took one to the 
motorcycle show and got people very interested, you know, in a P50. Uh, that had one wheel in the front and two at the back. And they were telling everybody that being tested down the TT course uh, and would do 100 miles to the gallon uh, and all this sort of thing. Well, it never had an engine in. <laughs> so that was kind of con on the public. We decided that that wasn't very stable. So we changed it around, put two wheels in the front and one at the back, which made a big difference. So. He, he, Cyril was one of these people who took an idea and developed it to a certain extent. And then, uh, once this was successful, changed on to something else. You know, P50, then on to Trident, had enough of that, so sell it uh, and get some money from it and we'll move on to something else. So we have a hovercraft, which uh, we got it just hovering, uh, but there was no skirt on it. We were short of power, it should have been geared down, or a bigger engine in it to get a bit more lift, and should have had a skirt on it, you know. But then that was, you know, got that far, and that was it. Well, I think he kind of studied the market a bit to start off with and decided that a, a enclosed scooter was the thing to build and that's what it was. I mean, it's a nice comfortable thing to it's, it's sitting in, no doubt about that. Um, and some people had them and, and loved them, you know. Some people couldn't remember to put oil in the pestle, which wasn't very really successful. Uh, and we also had some trouble with the DKW engines, but some of them did give trouble with the crankshafts. And uh, we replaced crankshafts and a few of them. But um, the funny thing was, the first engine we had in the first P50, there was a member of staff who lived in Castleton. And uh, he said to Cyril, do you mind if I use the P-50 to go backwards and forwards to work? Well, he did. And he went backwards and forwards to work for weeks or months. And he hammered that, really hammered it all the way. And it never gave a moment's trouble. And yet when we got on, so, production engines, we had a bit of trouble, you know, crankshafts and one thing or another. The funny thing is, um, Brenda's son was at uh, King William's College and ended up being elected chief fire officer. Uh, and Garth Keast into the fire station to see what was going on. And he found a P-50. Well, the P-50 had come from uh, the vicar of Castletown, bought it originally, uh, and whether he couldn't cope with it or not, but he gave it to the college. So Keith thought this was good fun. So Keith always ke keen on engineering and that sort of thing. Um, got it going and the boys were having a run around the, the college with it until somebody turned it on his side and one of the uh, masters saw it. So that was it. We all had to be put away again. So that was the end of that. <laughs> you had a mould um, two moulds actually, had a mould for the bottom of the car, which was shaped, and then you had the top shape, and one sat on top of the other, and you riveted it together, you know. Um, and of course, it's like everything else with fiberglass, you've got to have a mould, where you put a gel coat on, which is the finished coat, then you lay it up with resin and fiberglass, 
and that's it. So you had two pieces. You put them together. And in this case, they were riveted together. Um, and that was it. The, all the mechanical pieces were made out of, uh, originally out of three quarter round tube. But latterly, it was all later that Trident was all square tube. You know, when I had a, an A frame, an A bracket to give you independent suspension, um, which little suspension, spring suspension units on it. You had two on the front, one on the back, and the engine sat in a, a, a frame of three quarters st mile of steel that was kind of hinged with um, rubber brackets at the front. And just the, the um, looked like a shock absorber on the back. And then it was chains up, you know. But it was all one unit. You put the engine in, into the, what you call a subframe, and then put the whole lot in together. And all that was done in here. Um, we did have a bit of, of a production on it. It didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't very long, night, but uh, it, there wa was a production line here. During this time, Cyril decided that to produce stuff quicker, if we could mould the top half in a piece of PVC, we could just go woomph virtually and that would be the thing made or the, the outside coating made drop it in the mould and then just lay it up so you didn't have the trouble of gel coating which is like painting with thick paint and we made a big uh, what we call the fork poster we had a mould or a former of the P50 and we had a frame above where we put a big sheet of PVC we had a heater on top we heated it up so far and then there was four columns with chain drive and a motor drive in them and, that, and they all came down together pulled this PVC sheet down over the top of the Thing. Well, that was all right, but um, we made quite a few of those, um, and you can tell tell the ones that are, are PVC uh, because on the, the back where the rear lamps went on, there was a, 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 a bit of a bump to put the rear lamps on. But when we put this. Uh, PVC down over it. It left a, a fillet on the top, like a little wedge on the top. So <laughs> you can tell which is which is the thing because it was sucked down, sucked down by air. You just extracted the air out of the the thing, you know. So I reckon it was about maybe up to a hundred and up to a hundred probably up to a hundred tridents uh, and there's about 25, 26 or something P50s in existence and about 28 tridents up to now but there is a few odd ones still appearing <laughs> in peculiar places you know but that's as far as we know I mean you make you could make the, the fairing the fiberglass bits uh, probably in the morning, you know. But then you've got all the mechanical stuff to make. Uh, and then to put it all together. And then there was lights on it, so it all had to be wired. Um, and then there was a, a plastic molding that went on the top of the steering wheel that had a fancy switch on it and that there was a button to stop the engine and there was a, 
you could turn the lights on and off with this tiny little switch. So there's a molding made for that. But on the P50, we used to make a mold or two pieces of, of mold for the rack and pinion steering. So they're just kind of clamped together and the rack moved backwards and forwards. And that, that. These were all made in a tiny little injection molding machine. Um, and then also on the ejection mold machine, they used to make track rod ends, you know, for the ball joints, for the steering and stuff. And um, they were just kind of produced with one shot of uh, plastic. In this case, it was nylon. Um, but then we found, when we started to do this, that Siddle had got a whole lot of balls ma made for him, which is a false sear with a hole through it, right? When we moulded the nylon round them, they were too tight and they, you couldn't swivel them. So to get over this, we had to paint them with amyl acetate which is a liquid, just something like super glue. Um, but they, they'd use it now as um, skin. You know, as a skin. If you put it on things, just like a piece of skin. Um, and then when we got them out of the mold, right, you just had to wiggle the the sphere backwards and forwards and this amyl acetate would kind of come off um, and you had a nice free joint then so there was a lot of interesting things you know from scratch you know instead of buying ball joints in we had to make them instead of buying um, rack and pinion steering it we had to buy the racks and the pinions and make the casting for them. Then when he came to the trident, Settle decided that was no good, so we'd make a steering box out of uh, two halves of metal that were pressed out with a chain in it and the chain used to, uh, a link on the chain, as you turn the, the one wheel, link on the chain used to push the wheel left or right. Mm. Mm. I would hammer it down the road here. Before I went out, I would make sure that the brakes were all even, etc. Um, and I would take it out from here, hammer it down the road, down as far as the castle and back again. And if not, ha nothing happened at that time, it was fit to go. <laughs> so I had the, the nice job of, of testing everyone. This was good, actually. Well, they took the one to the motorcycle show in the first place. The one with no engine in. Well, that started, and then they'd done a bit of advertising, the motorcycle, I think. Uh, and places like that, and then um, people like Two Strokes took an interest and we delivered 12 down, that's the ones on the boat, 12 down to Two Strokes and various other firms ordered, you know, one or two or thing. How, how they knew about it, I don't know, but it must have been advertised somewhere. That wasn't my department. Well, we, there was one or two sold here. But most of them were sold on, 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 in England. Yeah. Uh, there was one, an odd one sold to Ireland. I think there was an odd one sold to America. Price goes up, it's like antiques, isn't it? Some antiques to a, to a like the, the mini, the P50 was produced for £199. Uh, 
one of the last ones sold in America were 140,000, I think. I mean, it's not, it's not unbelievably ridiculous. And Brenda said, why didn't you keep one? He didn't think anything about keeping one. He didn't imagine it was going to be worth anything more than what it was, you know. When we got into this situation that we had to blow bubbles for, for, the, for the racing fans ourselves, we had to learn how to um, play around with Perspex. So we built a box uh, about so, so big. And um, we put a form in, in steel, the shape of two fairings, two, two, two fairings, two, two bubbles, right? And in the bottom of the box, we put a lot of, always on the, the um, cheap, they were old KUKA, electric KUKA elements, right? And controls. And then we also had above some cooker elements and controls on a, on a, a rail so we could run it backwards and forward. And we put a piece of perspex in. Now the first one in the morning used to take quite a long time to try and get some warmth in the box. And then you had a, a corny way of finding out how if it was hot enough, we had a, a pencil that, that marked at the right temperature. So you went round the box and just marked to see how it was because the center used to get hotter than the size. And once you could see the center drop a little bit, shut those off, shut those heaters off and use just the ones that were round about. Uh, it took about getting used to you know, uh, and then you'd blow it up with compressed air, blow the bubble. And all we had was a piece of um, wire bed over the top. Blow it up to the wire and then just hold it there. Because the box wasn't to totally airtight. So you just had to blow it up to there, knock it off, and then just leave a little bit of air on until it had cooled enough to set. And then you take it out and put another one in. Cyril uh, was one of these people who would uh, come in and say, right, when you make that. He'd have, he'd draw it out and he drew the hovercraft out. Uh, and the staff here in this side of the building made a, a mould or moulds to make this hovercraft, which was so big by so big, you know. And it kind of rounded at the side, and in the middle there was a big fan. Now he just he. Uh, drew this fan out to his design, right? And it worked brilliantly because he was a good engineer, he had a good head. And we mounted a um, Triumph twin motorcycle engine, but it was one that was a, an industrial engine from during the war. Uh, and that would drive it, and that would just get it to lift off the ground. But there was no skirt on it, and the engine was at maximum. But it wasn't at maximum, you mean. It was maximum for what it was doing, but it wasn't on maximum revs. So it wanted the gearing changing so that the engine could rev a bit harder and produce a more lift. But then that was it last interest then, uh, and the hovercraft was put to one side. 